Thank you very much, Constanze, for the nice introduction. I have very good memories of my visits to Berlin. There were times where I was here more or less on a monthly basis, and I was very well known in the night train between Freiburg and uh, this place here. So today uh, I will talk about uh, synapses and their relation to network function. I realize many uh, of the subsequent speakers have the same title. Uh, but anyhow, I will give it a slightly different uh, twist, uh, I, I hope, uh, in, in the following. Now, as all of you will know, the hippocampus plays a key role in learning and uh, memory. And one of the hallmark properties of uh, that memory, which is particularly located in the C3 region of the hippocampus, is the ability of the circuit to reconstruct incomplete or degraded uh, patterns. So to reconstruct a complete memory uh, from a partial input. Now, the synaptic mechanisms underlying that process are uh, more or less unknown, but from several modeling studies, early modeling studies, we have at least a couple of very good ideas uh, about of how this might happen. So this image here, as you of course know, is the classical Cajal picture of the hippocampus, showing the region that is primarily important for this uh, process of pattern completion, as it is called, uh, in the C3 uh, region. Now here on the right hand side you can see a model depiction of the same circuit. So if you make the comparison you might see that these are the C3 pyramidal cells. We have an input coming from the dentate gyrus granule cells, uh, the mossy fiber input, and uh, also we have a GABAergic interneuron that controls the excitability of the circuit. And finally, very importantly, we have uh, here uh, in the apical dendrites uh, of these cells the recurrent C3, C3 uh, collaterals. And the model suggests that synaptic plasticity at these synapses plays a key role uh, in the storage of information and in the completion process uh, during retrieval of memories. Now, how does that work? The basic idea is very simple. Here is our network model, and if we now apply an input pattern represented here by a binary sequence uh, to the MOSI fiber uh, input to the circuit, uh, this activates a subset of cells, obviously, in, in the circuit. Now, due to the fact that uh, we have this tight connectivity matrix here, this dense connectivity matrix, uh, which then um, generates pre- and post-synaptic activity, it is easy to imagine that uh, there is a synaptic plasticity process going on on these synapses, and that these synapses here in the connectivity matrix uh, become potentiated. Now, when we apply a second pattern, we stimulate and uh, also store information in a second subset of synapses. When we apply a third pattern, we store information in a third uh, subset, and so on. Now, this sounds uh, a little trivial at this point, but the non-trivial aspects occur in the retrieval phase. Because if you now go to the second phase, the retrieval phase, and apply an incomplete pattern to the circuit, or likewise a degraded pattern, such an incomplete pattern would initially activate only a subset of the original subset of the neuronal ensemble that encoded uh, for that uh, pattern. But due to the fact that the synapses were strengthened um, previously via some plasticity process, it is quite easy to imagine that the remaining elements, the missing elements, uh, will be uh, recruited in, in that uh, process. So what we get back in the end is the original pattern, and this is why this process is called uh, pattern completion. So now this all looks very nice. We have a nice model, we have some ideas, uh, but obviously the problems start when we uh, try to examine the model parameters in a quantitative and, and systematic way. Because uh, obviously, uh, clearly there are many assumptions here, and it is not at all clear whether uh, the assumptions of the model are indeed consistent with reality and are consistent with the biological properties of, of the neural uh, networks. Now, one of the key assumptions uh, is that there is this dense connectivity matrix, and you can see quite nicely in this scheme that uh, here, at least in this model uh, representation, we have an almost all-to-all -all, uh, connectivity. So the question then is, how realistic is this all-to-all -all, uh, connectivity that we see here uh, in the model? And if, it's not con if the real biological properties are different, what exactly are these biological uh, properties? Now to show you once more that uh, it is obviously quite unlikely that the connectivity is all-to-all, -all, we can make a very simple uh, consideration and, and estimation 
uh, if you assume that a single CA3 pyramidal neuron has 10,000 spines, and if you assume that the synaptic contacts uh, per a connection between two cells um, has a number of five, and if we further assume that we have 330,000 uh, pyramidal neurons in the circuit, it is very evident, because from these three numbers we can calculate the average connection probability, that the connectivity can never ever be all to all, but must be uh, far away from this, simply because the synaptic space and the number of spines in the circuit uh, are, are limited, and therefore connectivity is limited, because uh, the number of pyramidal neurons is much larger uh, than the number uh, of available uh, spines. So we decided to uh, experimentally directly measure the connectivity between C3 uh, pyramidal neurons. And uh, what we started with is the standard approach um, in the field, which is performing uh, paired recordings uh, between uh, cells. But what we found very soon it was that connectivity was much lower than what at least the all-to-all -all connectivity of the model uh, suggested. So we made many pairs, several hundred pairs, but in the end we found uh, very little uh, connectivity. We therefore decided to use an alternative approach, uh, which is uh, shown in the next slide or the slide after that. But before I come to that, I should mention the uh, collaborators uh, who have uh, contributed to this work and performed these uh, experiments. So what I will show is mainly uh, due to the very hard work of Jose Guzman uh, in my lab. And this is uh, done in respect to morphological analysis in a long-lasting uh, collaboration with my friend uh, Michael Frotcher sitting over uh, there. And uh, also uh, uh, Claudia Espinosa, who uh, came here to this meeting, uh, is now involved in this microcircuit analysis uh, with our multicell recording. And finally, I have a lot of support from Alois Schlögel, who is software engineer and helps me uh, to convert our ideas into concrete uh, quantitative uh, network models. So we then went forward and tried to measure systematically the functional connectivity between C3 uh, pyramidal neurons. And uh, to do this and to overcome the limitation of the paired recordings, we made what is now called octuple recordings, which is a simultaneous recording from eight cells in a slice preparation. So this scheme shows very clearly the advantage of uh, this approach, because clearly when you record from eight cells in a subsequent paired recording configuration, the number of connections you can test uh, are very limited. So you can test four times two, which is eight uh, possible connections. However, when you do the same analysis from eight cells in an octuple configuration, in which you record from all these eight neurons at the same time, you have a much higher yield and a much larger number of connections which you can test, which is eight uh, times 756. So this means that there is a huge increase in the experimental yield because you can test a much higher number of combinations. Furthermore, there's an additional advantage because you can not only look at uh, connectivity in a pairwise manner, uh, but also you can look at higher order connectivity uh, motifs, which will be relevant for analyzing the connectivity structure of, of the system. So we have used octuple recordings just to tell a little bit about the experimental conditions we are using, using slices from 16 to 30 day old uh, rats at either room temperature or physiological temperature. We are using uh, relatively mature element, uh, um, animals uh, for our experiments uh, to avoid problems due to developmental change in connectivity. We use relatively thick slices, 400 micrometer, and perform very deep recordings uh, to maintain the connectivity as much as possible. We focus on the CA3B subfield, which is the subfield of the CA3 area which is best maintained under our conditions. And finally, we record postsynaptic neurons either in the current clamp or the voltage clamp configuration uh, to record EPSPs or uh, EPSCs uh, in, in our conditions. So when we do these experiments, the experimental situation looks as follows. Here you can see a uh, light microscopic image of uh, our cells uh, with an infrared uh, video microscopy uh, method. Uh, here the red areas are the somata of the recorded cells. You might be able to see the eight electrodes. Uh, clearly, because we are recording very deep in the slice preparation, the limitation uh, of uh, the optical uh, resolution uh, is uh, clearly evident, and you can't see the pipettes uh, very well. But anyhow, you can get an idea about uh, what we are doing. Uh, 
We then test systematically the connectivity between individual cells in a connectivity matrix, as shown here at the bottom. And you might be able to see that uh, this cell four here, in which we evoke a train of action potentials under current clamp conditions, clearly is functionally synaptically connected to cell number three, as you can see here from these single uh, EPSC uh, traces. Um, now, furthermore, we are also combining our analysis with a morphological uh, analysis of the cells. So we fill the cells with biocytin during uh, recording and then uh, perform a visualization using uh, diaminobenzidine as uh, uh, chromogene. And this is shown here in the right uh, panel, which allows us to unequivocally identify uh, the recorded neurons as C3 uh, pyramidal neurons. And this is an important point for us because one of the general rules in the lab is that one should never record from unidentified uh, cells in, in a slice preparation, uh, at least, and also in vivo. So in summary, then, we can uh, record uh, then under these conditions with relatively increased yield um, the properties of synaptic uh, transmission and, and functional connectivity at these previously largely inaccessible uh, synapses. So we then went on and characterized the basic uh, properties of uh, synaptic transmission using recording of either EPSPs under current clamp conditions or um, uh, EPSCs under voltage uh, clamp conditions. And these summary bar graphs show uh, in total uh, the uh, properties of 146 uh, functional connections, which we found in a total number of 15,930 uh, tested uh, possible connections. So this uh, sounds a little boring, uh, but uh, these uh, data in, in the end are very important because if you want to develop reality-based um, neuronal network uh, models, these parameters are exactly the parameters uh, you, you want to have in quantitative numbers, not only regarding mean values or, or median values, but also regarding the variability of, of the respective uh, parameters. So we then went on and uh, characterized what we now call the macro connectivity, which is the connectivity between multiple cells uh, in the network. And in particular, we wanted to focus on three uh, different aspects, which is we wanted to determine the mean connection probability. We wanted to quantify the distance dependence of that connection probability, um, the dependence on the distance between the cell bodies uh, of, of the two recorded uh, cells. And we finally wanted uh, to have um, information about whether the connectivity is random uh, or uh, non-random uh, in this uh, network. So we first uh, determined the connection uh, probability, and the results are shown here in the next slide. So what we did is we uh, totally uh, plotted uh, the number of connections tested as well as the number of functional connections found against intersomatic distance in a bint histogram representation, and then divided these two numbers, which give us a measure of the connection probability uh, as a function of distance. The resulting values are shown here at, at the bottom, and if you look at this uh, graph, it's immediately evident that there are uh, two exciting uh, features here uh, of, of the connectivity. The first one being that the connection probability is very low, so we obtained a mean estimate uh, of um, a proportion of a, of a connection probability of 1% uh, under our condi conditions, which is the average uh, connection probability. So this was quite surprising, especially in light of the models I showed you initially. But a second interesting feature was that there was very little distance dependence of that uh, connectivity, uh, which is also different here from what has been previously found in uh, cortical uh, microcircuits. So we think then that sparse and distributed connectivity are hallmark properties of uh, the connectivity uh, between C3 uh, pyramidal neurons in, in the C3 circuit. We then went to the next question and asked whether the connectivity is random or whether there are any order, higher order connectivity motives in, in the circuit. And uh, the way to do this was that we counted the number of disynaptic and higher order connectivity motives in, in our measurements. So this is our total uh, data set and uh, the open bars uh, indicate the number of uh, different disynaptic motives we found. We focused on reciprocal convergence divergence and disynaptic uh, chain motives as indicated here uh, by the schematic uh, drawings. 
So these open bars then represent the numbers of uh, these motifs in our total uh, data set. And we then, to find out whether the connectivity was random or not, or whether these numbers were significantly above the random value, uh, we performed a simulation, a Monte Carlo simulation, of our exact uh, data set um, and our exact recording configurations we had uh, in this uh, data set. And again, in a very similar way, counted uh, the number of disynaptic motives under the assumption of random connectivity with a constant uh, corresponding to the average uh, connection probability. And what we found was that, interestingly, in all cases, the uh, abundance of these motives was much higher than what we would have expected uh, by chance, between a factor of 2.9 and a factor of uh, 6.3. Furthermore, we found a couple of cases in our octuple recordings, as shown here by the examples at the bottom, where there was an even larger, higher order number of connections uh, between uh, the cells. So here in this octuple, for example, we had seven uh, individual synapses. And clearly, the probability that something like this happens by chance in a low uh, pro connection probability condition uh, is uh, extremely low. So in summary then, these data suggest and, and indicate that connectivity between the C3 pyramidal neurons is highly non-random and that the system and the network is characterized by an overabundance of uh, different uh, higher order connectivity uh, motives. So this is then about uh, what we call the macro connectivity. What about the micro connectivity in, in, in the circuit? which means what about the properties of the connections between two individual uh, given cells. So specifically, we were interested in three parameters, which is the number of contacts per connection, the location of the synaptic contacts on basal or apical uh, dendritic uh, target structures uh, and cells, and the, of course, uh, functional properties of the synaptic uh, connections, uh, which is uh, synaptic efficacy. Now, to determine the number of contacts per connection and the um, location of these synaptic uh, contacts, uh, we first had to overcome uh, one of the limitations of our light microscopic uh, approach. Because as I showed you, we record from eight cells, and clearly, if you label with cytine-based approaches eight cells at the same time, you end up basically with a very complicated uh, arrangement of um, axons, uh, and uh, under these conditions, obviously, it is very difficult uh, to identify synaptic uh, contacts. We therefore had to develop f first a technique that not only allows us to label, but also to delabel uh, neurons un under our conditions. And the basic uh, procedure is uh, highlighted here. So what we are doing is we are first establishing an octuple recording configuration. Uh, we record from these uh, eight cells at the same time and test their connectivity for a very short uh, time. And we then uh, apply suction and obtain nucleated patches from the non-connected uh, cells which results in a de-staining and, and de-labeling uh, of these non-connected cells, whereas the labeled cells, the biocytin labeled uh, cells, uh, remain uh, in, in, in the system. So under these conditions, then, we are in a position to selectively label uh, two of the cells uh, which are synaptically uh, connected. So by doing this, then, we can get a very precise uh, morphological analysis uh, of the location of the synaptic contacts and, and the number of the synaptic uh, contacts. So this uh, graph here shows uh, one example. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a synaptically connected uh, cell, so uh, um, cell pair. Uh, so the right cell is the presynaptic neuron, the left cell is the postsynaptic neuron, and the yellow part is the axon of the presynaptic cell, and you might be able to see that there's one putative contact which is uh, formed here uh, on the dendrite of the, of the postsynaptic cell. So we then went on and quantified uh, the location and numbers of the contacts. We found uh, exactly um, uh, equal proportions of one and uh, two contact uh, synapses. We found that the synapses were slightly more abundant on the basal dendrites of their target cells uh, than on the apical dendrites. And we found again an equal proportion of uh, synaptic contacts on the fimbrial side uh, or on the hilar side with respect uh, to the presynaptic neuron.
Finally, we quantified the location of the synaptic contacts, and it turned out that these synapses, uh, considering the large extent of the dendritic tree, uh, were uh, quite uh, proximally located with an average uh, distance from the soma of the postsynaptic cell of approximately 100 uh, micrometers. So they are quite uh, proximal, which obviously is an important factor in shaping uh, the efficacy uh, of these uh, synapses. So this then tells us about the uh, functional, uh, the, about the morphological properties of the synapses. But clearly, many of you are functional, um, functionally oriented and, and are electrophysiologists. So how does that number of uh, contacts per connection relate to the number of release sites? Now, we uh, tested the number of release sites uh, by reducing the calcium concentration in the, in the bath. And the prediction of the experiment is very clear. If we have a single site a synapse, then we would expect that the amplitude of the successes will not be changed, but only the failures, the number of failures of synaptic transmission uh, will be altered. By contrast, if you have a large number of synapses um, and, and contacts per connection, it is clear that the amplitude of the synaptic events of the successes, uh, in other words, uh, will also be changed. Now, we have tested these predictions in a, in a quantitative way. And if you look at this uh, graph in which a, a plot of the EPSP amplitude against time during a reduction of the extracellular calcium concentration is uh, depicted, you will immediately see it that there is, of course, a huge effect on the number of failures, which are centered around uh, zero amplitude here in, in, in this graph. So it seems then that the number of failures uh, are dramatically changing. Uh, which uh, provides some evidence that the number of release sites, the functional release sites here in this case, uh, must be relatively low. We further performed a quantitative analysis, uh, as shown here in the remainder of, of, the, of the image, uh, by uh, plotting the amplitude of the uh, synaptic events um, in histogram form and fitting them with a binomial model of release. And what we found was that, uh, on average, in the median value, uh, there were three release sites uh, per uh, con uh, connection. So in summary, then, these results suggest that not only the number of anatomical contacts per connection is low, but also the uh, number of functional connections uh, is, is low in this system. So we then uh, went on and uh, obviously wanted to know if only a single site uh, corresponds, or in some cases uh, two sites, and morphological contacts contribute to synaptic transmission, how do the postsynaptic cells ever get to the firing threshold? Now to address this point, we measured systematically temporal summation and spatial summation. So this slide here shows temporal summation in which we repetitively stimulated the presynaptic uh, neuron here with 10 action potentials at a frequency of 100 hertz. And as you can see, there is a very nice uh, temporal summation. So despite the fact that the amplitude of the first EPSP is very small, uh, there is an increase, great increase in, in the summated uh, signal. And that uh, factor, that increase um, uh, of amplitude factor, uh, can be identical to the number of uh, action potentials in, in the, in the presynaptic cell, again showing that this summation is a, is a very efficient uh, process. Now, what about spatial summation? The octuple recording also allows us to uh, examine the spatial uh, summation. So here uh, we have um, an example of two converging inputs on the same target cell, as shown here in, in the left panel. So this is the first synapse between cell number one and the postsynaptic cell. This is the second synapse between cell number two and the postsynaptic cell. And this is the result uh, on the right panel of a joint activation uh, of the two cells. Now, as you can see, again, there is a nice spatial summation uh, in this case. And uh, if you now go ahead and uh, take the arithmetic sum of these individual components and um, compare that sum with the recorded uh, signal that is recorded uh, by joint activation of, of the two cells, it turns out that apparently the summation process is, is very linear. We have further estimated the number of inputs then based on this linearity result uh, that were required uh, to bring the postsynaptic cell to the firing threshold. So here you can see a plot of membrane potential against the number of stimulated inputs. 
And when you uh, do a fitting here with a straight line and extrapolate to the threshold value, you can, at least under the assumption of uh, linearity, uh, obtain the number of cells which are needed uh, to bring the postsynaptic cell to firing threshold. And it turns out that this number under in vitro conditions is around seven, and under in vivo conditions where the membrane potential is more depolarized is uh, approximately three. So in summary then, these results tell us that both the temporal summation and the spatial summation in these synapses is very efficient and uh, that a relatively small number of inputs have to be activated to bring the postsynaptic cell uh, to the firing uh, threshold, which has clear implications for the size of the ensembles uh, of cells uh, that uh, have to be active uh, to generate firing in the CA3 uh, network. So this is, of course, now all interesting. This is uh, synaptic uh, physiology. Uh, but of course, the question now is, how do these findings relate uh, to the pattern completion, which is what I was alluding to uh, in, in the first part of my, of my talk? Now, to address this question and to, in particular, see how the sparse connectivity and the properties of synaptic transmission would impact on pattern completion, we decided to develop a realistic or reality-based, at least, uh, network model of uh, pattern uh, completion. So the assumptions of the model are that the neurons are binary neurons, so they are represented as inactive or active. They are endowed with recurrent connectivity. Uh, the recurrent synapses are endowed in turn with clipped Habian synaptic plasticity, which is not an unrealistic assumption. Um, I didn't have time to talk about this, but we have also studied the synaptic plasticity of these uh, synapses in, in more detail. We have introduced linear and global inhibition in the circuit, which represents this single interneuron. And we have represented recall as an iterative process uh, because we all know that uh, thinking about problems and memorizing um, certain configurations and, and events uh, takes some time. So presumably it takes uh, iterations uh, through rhythmic activity uh, in, the, in, in the brain, which is what we try to represent here by this iterative recall. And finally, and probably most importantly, we implemented the network model in full size, so this means we had to simulate and introduce all 330,000 uh, pyramidal neurons which are thought uh, to be present in, in the circuit. Now, how do we do these simulations? Uh, we proceed in exactly the same way as I showed it to you in the schematic uh, network model. So we first apply a storage phase and store M patterns in the system. We then run a retrieval phase, so we test degraded patterns, exactly as I showed it to you uh, initially. And we finally determine the performance of the network model by determining the correlation between the original patterns and, and the final uh, patterns with a correlation coefficient. And we finally plot this correlation against the number of items which have been and the number of patterns that have been stored uh, in the network model, as well as the amount of uh, inhibition. And this is represented in a three-dimensional uh, manner as shown here uh, in the uh, bottom graph. The picture is a little fuzzy, but it may give you an idea of what you can expect in the, in the next two slides. So these are then the assumptions of the model. What are the results? The first question we wanted to know is whether a network model that has sparse connectivity as measured experimentally is indeed able to perform this task of pattern completion. So to do this, we started out with a connection probability of 3%. So what we got under these conditions is that indeed, after storage of uh, several thousand patterns, we were able to retrieve these patterns um, relatively accurately. So here you can see again, as I mentioned, the three-dimensional graph in which the pattern correlation, the correlation between the original pattern and the retrieved pattern, is plotted against the pattern load, which is the number of patterns that have been stored in the network, as well as the inhibition factor. We do not know how much inhibition we have at a certain time point, uh, and therefore we have to vary inhibition as a, as a free parameter. So as you can see from this high correlation area here, which covers a large part of the parameter space, uh, there's a very nice retrieval and, and uh, correlation with the original pattern showing that the pattern completion process uh, works very nicely. 
Now the key question, of course, of, is now what happens if we reduce the connectivity to slightly more um, realistic values, because I was talking about 1% uh, uh, connectivity, and even if we account for uh, lack of connectivity and reduction of connectivity in the slice preparation, the errors are unlikely to be uh, more than 2%, so we obviously have a lower connectivity. Now, somewhat unfortunately, it turns out that reducing the connectivity degraded substantially the performance of the network model. Because as you can see here, for a connection probability of 1.5%, there's only very little uh, correlation between original and retrieved pattern, which means failure of uh, the pattern completion uh, process. And if you further go down with the connectivity to the experimentally determined number of 1%, uh, the failure is even more uh, prominent. So this is very disappointing news for the pattern completion model because it tells us that uh, the pattern completion doesn't work with the realistic uh, connectivity. However, fortunately, there are two ways of how the, the pattern completion process can be rescued. One way is a little trivial, which is increasing the activity uh, in the network uh, model, which we uh, did here, which results in a small parameter space uh, area where uh, the pattern correlation is uh, again uh, rescued. But there's a second and more connectivity related way, which is related to the overabundance of motives, which I showed you uh, previously. So this is shown here uh, in the center in, in the model, in which we plot again pattern correlation against pattern load and inhibitory factor. Uh, and this is done now here for a connectivity of 1%. But this time, in the presence of these disynaptic motives, the abundance of which we increased by a factor of five above the random uh, level. So as it turns out, and as you will see immediately, uh, this introduction of these motives led to a very substantial increase in uh, the pattern correlation, again, in a, in a nice rescue of the pattern completion uh, process, showing that apparently the properties of the network are quite supportive uh, of the pattern completion process. Now, we have analyzed this phenomenon in much more detail, and I don't have time to go into uh, the details very extensively, but one of the things and one of the results we found was that apparently the disynaptic motives are, are very important, because if we selectively el eliminate the disynaptic motives, this uh, again eliminates the ability of the network to complete uh, the patterns. So we conclude from these data that the insertion of the connectivity motives, and in particular the disynaptic motives, uh, retrieves uh, the and, and improves uh, the pattern completion uh, process. So this shows a quite nice link between the macro connectivity of the network and the pattern completion process. What about micro connectivity? And this brings me to my last slide. So clearly, you, if you think about the problem, uh, and if you think about how the number of contacts per connection might affect the pattern completion process, there are two different opposing predictions uh, that could be made. One possibility might be that as you increase the number of contacts per connection, you might increase the stability of synaptic transmission. You might reduce fluctuations in the amplitude of the uh, synaptic events. And that might be good for uh, pattern completion because it would convey a higher level of stability uh, to synaptic uh, transmission. Now, we have tested this by introducing synaptic uh, variability but uh, what, we, and what we found was indeed that um, putting in a coefficient of variation of one of the synaptic amplitude in comparison to a coefficient of variation of 0.5, that indeed reducing the coefficient of variation consistent with the hypothesis I just mentioned uh, slightly enlarges the area in the parameter space where pattern correlation uh, is high and where pattern completion is, is possible. However, if you think about it more carefully, then there is a second aspect which is not considered in this simple uh, computation, which is that clearly, as I mentioned initially, synaptic space is uh, limited. So there is a limited number of spines on the postsynaptic uh, cell. And what that means and what that implies, in fact, is that increasing the number of contacts per connection would re reduce the average connectivity that you would uh, observe uh, in the circuit, simply because you have a constant number of synaptic contacts, and if you put more contacts per connection, you have to reduce the connectivity uh, to make that uh, synaptic space um, uh, available. So there's a second uh, correlated phenomenon, 
which is reduction in the connectivity. So the question now is, which of these factors wins in that um, competition? And the answer is connectivity, as shown here in the right panel. So here in this simulation, we again used a low connection probability, uh, and um, we uh, again used uh, the coefficient of variation that we would have here uh, on the left-hand side. And it is obvious that this increase, this beneficial effect of reducing the uh, coefficient of variation does not play out under these conditions, but rather the reduction in the, in the connection uh, probability. So in summary, then, these data suggest that uh, probably the microconnectomic properties of the synaptic uh, connections with the small number of contacts uh, per connection and the small number of functional release sites uh, relatedly probably are not such a stupid design for uh, such an auto-associative uh, network model that uh, performs the computation of pattern completion. And uh, clearly, having this small number uh, of contacts per connection, despite the fact that it has a slight disadvantage regarding synaptic noise and variability, has a big advantage in terms of maximizing uh, the connectivity in, in the circuit. So this is the summary of the results I showed you in my talk. It seems I don't have time to uh, go into this, but it's always dangerous to tell me that I have a lot of time, obviously. Uh, and I want to close with Einstein, who said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I hope with the model I showed you, we found uh, a reasonable compromise. And finally, I would again highlight and reiterate the huge contribution uh, of my group at IST Austria. Uh, so here th is the entire group, and it looks like a very peaceful environment. But in practice, we are living in the center of a construction site at this institute, so we are sometimes trying to break out uh, a little bit. So this is the construction site, the institute under construction. This is Lab Building East, where the neuroscience uh, groups are uh, located. And finally, that's the rest of, of the faculty, uh, the recruitment of which is one, one of my tasks. So thank you very much again uh, for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.